It's been said that in Africa, manufacturing is only for the brave. Its share in GDP has been falling in the region over the last three decades and was just 11% in 2014. But at the same time, manufacturing production has been increasing faster in sub-Saharan Africa than in the rest of the world, with its share in world manufacturing on the up. And as China transitions to a consumer-driven economy, some are saying this gives the continent a golden opportunity. So can the continent finally seize this manufacturing momentum? And what further steps are needed in the process of industrializing Africa? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, Africa is thinking industrialization. Economies on the continent of 1.2 billion people are aggressively looking to reduce dependence on the once prosperous but now uncertain future of the commodities trade. Experts tout economic diversification and value addition as a key drivers for Africa's economic transformation. And the continent is now working with partners like China to achieve its industrialization goals. Africa contributes only 2% of global manufacturing output. Over the past two decades, the continent's economies have largely been driven by the commodities trade, but returns from this cycle have been on a steady decline, causing strains in national budgets for countries heavily reliant on goods such as oil and metals. Analysts now vouch for diversification as the only obvious option to cushion African markets from a global slump in commodity prices. When you look at what is happening to, to to Nigeria, to Gabon, to Equatorial Guinea, to Angola, particularly Angola and Nigeria. The slump in oil prices, at 60% decline in prices in the last two years, that is affecting their balance of payments, they don't have enough dollars. It's also affecting government revenue because the government was so dependent on royalties from oil. And they're having to deal this with more borrowing, either from the IMF, World Bank, or China itself. These shifts in global markets come at a time when China, Africa's largest trading partner and the world's leading manufacturer, is restructuring towards a more consumer and services-based economy. Many Chinese manufacturers are anticipated to relocate to Africa, making the continent a potential hub for the world's industries. Special economic zones have been set up across the continent and more are being developed with those in South Africa, Egypt and Ethiopia already exporting to developed economies. But Africa still faces a number of challenges on the way. Our linkages to our ports are still very poor by road and by rail. Uh, energy costs in Africa tend to be exceptionally high. We need to invest heavily in infrastructure in Africa so that you can get the competitive base that you need that is provided by infrastructure. Secondly, Engage the private sector outside of Africa. It is good to talk to the governments there. It's good to talk to uh, embassies and development, multilateral development agencies. But you've got to engage the industrialists themselves. While manufacturing plays a key role in the process of economic transformation, there is required for high quality growth, job creation and sustained progress. Yet the share of manufacturing in GDP has been falling in sub-Saharan Africa over the last three decades and was just 11% in 2014. Well, I sat down with Umar Saidi, the Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa at the International Finance Corporation, to find out more about the options Africa can pursue in its quest to industrialize. Omar, thank you very much. Now, a lot has been talked about industrialization, Africa's options for industrializing, and that there is no option for Africa at the moment but to industrialize if it has to achieve economic growth. Now, what are the options that Africa can pursue in industrialization, the short-term options, the medium-term, and the long-term? Well, industrialization, as you put it, is very, very important, Beatrice, because you have to move up the value chain. We cannot be a continent that continues to always um, sell our commodities and find ourselves in a situation when those prices are low, which is the situation at this moment, and we're very vulnerable. We have to enhance our game. To get to that level, there are a number of fundamental things that we need to tackle, although in some of those we're making progress. 
The first and very important one is to make sure that we enhance our ability to have the right infrastructure. The infrastructure gap is huge. Depending on who you talk to, it could go up to $100 billion a year. If you look at um, ports, about 90 ports or so, traffic is about 6% of the world traffic. Airports, 5%. You talk about electricity, one of the lowest. Uh, actually, the lowest uh, penetration rate. Uh, how can you industrialize if you don't have electricity? How can you industrialize if you cannot move your goods from point A to point B, which is the transport? So infrastructure is important. Second thing that is important is to enhance the investment climate, to make it easier for people to do business so that they can take us the value chain. Um, and third, I would just say it's important to enhance our skills. Our skills. So immediately, these are the things that you will have to tackle, uh, basically short to medium term. Now, if you think about the long term, obviously you need that. You also need to uh, make sure that you capture the benefits of the wonderful trend that is happening in this continent uh, with respect to better stability, uh, with respect to a growing demand, uh, growing middle class, um, some of the things that everybody is talking about, what is behind all of this growth. But you also think about things such as the uh, special industrial zones, uh, which have been successful mostly outside of Africa. Right. Some people, some of those are called uh, industrial parks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to make sure that it's not just a plan. Sometimes, well-meaning ideas, Beatrice, can take you to a situation where uh, you want to do the right thing, but you just cannot implement. Okay. Or it's yeah. I want to come back, though, to your uh, question, to your issue about infrastructure and the funding infrastructure gap there, because mm -hmm. you've talked about uh, it could be up to 100 billion that is needed uh, to, to fund infrastructure. Where is the gap there? Where is Africa finding that money? Is Africa actually bridging that infrastructure gap if it is key for industrialization? Well, this is where I really want to emphasize the fact that everybody's support is welcome, whether you're talking about the development finance institution, um, the local financial institutions that they work with, um, other countries such as China, European countries and everyone. This is not a place where you can really talk about competition because the field is really, really wide. But it is a place also where you sometimes have to think a little bit out of the box and look at the realities. Uh, in many cases, it's about risk appetite uh, because challenges are huge. And this is where, in some cases, for example, you have to find a way to come up with some sort of a blended finance uh, where somebody is willing to take a certain level of risk knowing that that is a calculated risk. Um, so, yes, the field is wide open. The gap is huge, and we're talking about annual gaps here. But everybody is welcome to try and fill that gap. Uh, in one way or the other, in many years, it's been sort of, depending on the year, it's been uh, you get closer to the target. Actually, you, I mean, you move up in the target, but not get closer, obviously. Uh, that's, what I wanted to, that's what I meant to say. Uh, but uh, my point here is that it is huge and that we all need to work together uh, to put in our own funding, but also mobilize funding from others. The risk perception for uh, Africa, though, does, it, does Africa today, with, with all the talk of uh, good economic growth over the last 10 years, uh, despite the slowing growth in Africa, uh, you know, in the, in the past couple of years, but... Is the risk still that high? Is the risk perception still that high about the continent? Well, the risk is there. Um, it, I, I cannot basically look at it in a straight face and say that it is not there. So to me, the big question is that when you're faced with the risk, how do you address that risk? How do you find tools to de-risk so that you can uh, be uh, relevant uh, in, in those countries? Uh, year in, year out, uh, we see lots of gains in terms of uh, stability. If you look at the map today and you go 10 years back, it is a different map. Uh, China's economy is now in transition away from a market-led economy to more of a services and uh, consumers and many are wondering what will the impact of that be for Africa, particularly uh, following China's announcement that it wants to now engage in industrial cooperation with Africa. For some time now, and it is increasing, uh, one of the consequences of what China is doing right now is that they have they're having more and more higher wages. And that's attraction to basically coming to uh, places like uh, Ethiopia, 
uh, or neighboring countries um, or places that are intrinsically known for having low labor costs to try and basically leverage that. So that trend is allowing us, is opening, I would say, doors uh, for, for some of our countries. But it's not that easy to. So labor cost is definitely an advantage that we have. We also have the raw material next door. But that's not just what you need. And this takes me to the point I was making earlier about infrastructure. I mean, think about logistics. Right. So sometimes just moving things, the, just the cost of that is higher in terms of relative percentage than these advantages that you have. So if you cannot leverage those in a way, then that advantage will disappear. And let me just give you an example of an industry where a niche has been found, which actually makes sense. Uh, and this applies to both uh, Kenya and Ethiopia. Look at the flower industry. You have logistics of two companies, two countries, that have an airline, I guess a national airline, that has basically daily flight to certain markets. You have a weather makes it, that makes it possible to have the right quality that you're looking for. If you put in an entity that can manage this well, and guess what? These are activities that are booming. We've actually invested in both countries uh, in that industry, and we've seen the results. I don't even uh, basically uh, uh, exclude the possibility of having these coming into a big market like uh, in, uh, in Netherlands and perhaps even being stemmed, say, made in Netherlands, but they probably were made uh, in, in some of our countries. So you can, by looking at logistics, by looking at a good business model, uh, obviously by working hard and just taking an opportunity in a particular niche, you can basically make a difference. And that was the reason why I gave this example. If Africa were to surmount its uh, industrialization challenges aside from infrastructure and aside from building uh, the labor force, the, the skills required for that, what else is needed? Well, leadership and really the capability to really also see that the private sector is part of the solution. Governments can just do so much. And that leadership will include discipline an organization. Without those two, I don't know that uh, we can face some of our challenges. So that part is extremely uh, important. Um, and also, for those of us who are involved in financing, it's very important that we think about also go, uh, thinking out of the box. Um, we have to find ways to continue to de-risk uh, those projects so that we can finance them. We have to put what we call PPPs, uh, public-private partnership, um, at the next level. It has to be real. Um, it has to just go beyond just the cliche and making those things happen. Um, and so the theme there for me is just not doing just the usual thing we are, we've been doing, but to do a little bit more because uh, the needs are significant. Right, Omar, thank you very much. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guest will help me further unpack Africa's industrialization. To stay with us. Here is a man representing a country which never was our colonizer. He is doing to us what we expected those who colonized us yesterday do. It's about moving the African agenda forward together with the Chinese in a win-win situation. I think this is now elevating the uh, partnership that China has with Africa to another level. We are saying to China thank you very much for China's understanding of Africa's difficulties and challenges as it has always done. We are thankful that the Chinese leadership and the people of China are prepared to be with us, to pull with us under these kind of circumstances. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to help me further chart the way for Africa's industrialization, I have expert guests standing by in Lagos, Eke Ubiji. He is the executive secretary of the Nigerian Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. 
in Beijing, Professor Ho Wenping. She's a research fellow at the Institute of West Asian and African Studies. And with me in Nairobi is consultant economist David Awiro. To you all, thank you for joining in this conversation. Uh, David, I'll start off with you, though. Africa's share of manufacturing in the world is said to be on the up. First of all, give us an indication of exactly what is Africa's state of manufacturing. Uh, thank you very much, Beaches. Um, what has been happening in Africa, if you look at the GDP composition, uh, most African states have their manufacturing at about 11%. And for some in the recent past was actually falling. Some fell even to 9%. So uh, basically indicating that manufacturing, we are witnessing even to some extent some de-industrialization that's happening. Uh, but that's, it's not all bad news because for a lot of what's happening globally, uh, incomes are rising in Asia and what that means is that some of these jobs will find themselves in Africa and so um, uh, Africa is looking out for uh, you know a, a growth uh, opportunity that will migrate from the commodity based growth that we witnessed in the in the last perhaps two uh, in fact five decades uh, into uh, an opportunity where we are seeing a job growth due to manufacturing and industrialization. Ike Obiji in Lagos, Africa is looking for growth opportunities. Manufacturing industrialization is going to be one of those opportunities. What is the scenario, though, in Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, in Nigeria here, the issue of industrialization, you know, we're going through some serious economic crisis uh, because the issue of uh, manufacturing have been neglected. Why we focus so much on the revenue from oil? But now, since the revenue from oil has really come down, everybody is in their streets. Now, manufacturing is very, very important. But a lot of things need to be done. Uh, infrastructure is very, very important. For example, in Nigeria, you're talking of uh, uh, manufacturing where you don't have constant power supply. How do you manufacture? Uh, the, those that are really functioning are generating their own power and uh, they are mostly the big players. What of the small players? How can they generate their own power? It's very, very key. Infrastructure is very, very important. Without infrastructure, we can't make much move. So the issue is that in Nigeria and other African countries, we should pay serious attention. If we are really serious to industrialize, pay serious attention to infrastructural development. Right. Power is very key road, transportation, all those issues are very, very important here. Yeah. Professor Ho Wenping, I want to wrap you in here, though, because uh, Africa is hoping to take into consideration China's economic transition from a uh, manufacturing-led to a consumer and services-led economy now. Are we starting to see, though, Chinese industries shifting to newer ground as a result of that change in Chinese economy? Uh, yes. Uh, as uh, the latest uh, China-African Jobsburg Summit has been uh, put forward, nowadays it's a, a golden time, uh, also a golden opportunity for China and Africa uh, to make a joint hand to uh, implement this uh, industrialization and also to transfer China's access uh, industrial uh, capacity. Uh, nowadays in China, uh, China is doing this uh, economic readjustment. And we are now facing the challenge, that is how to digest that there's uh, so much access, those uh, industrial productive capacity. Now it's no longer the shortage economy anymore. After 30 years uh, rapid economic development, China now becoming, uh, uh, you know, the access, uh, the oversupply, those productive uh, cap capacity and the manufactured goods. So right. China has served as a uh, uh, yeah, the biggest uh, trading partner for uh, almost 100 uh, countries uh, globally. So that's why uh, China now needs to uh, speed up this uh, industrial transfer. And in Africa, as my colleagues from uh, Nigeria and Kenya both mentioned, Africa also uh, had the bad need to uh, increase its uh, level of industrialization. So now this is uh, a complementary uh, with each other. So China has the capital uh, advantage and also has the technical know-how advantage and also has the access uh, extra, those uh, industrial capacity. Right. And in Africa, and there is a great need for that. 
David, I'll drop you in here because a lot of emphasis has now been placed on industrializing Africa, particularly after that uh, FOCAC summit in Johannesburg last year. What is Africa doing? Are we seeing a, a greater push now by African states to industrialize and to take advantage of uh, the uh, Chinese transition in the economy? Yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, there's renewed interest in, in Africa, not only from China, but also from, from other uh, partners, trading partners. But the biggest problem has been that the, the African trade with the world ha is as an imbalance, uh, even with China. And so this imbalance is brought about by, uh, you know, huge commodity exports to the world. And uh, in terms of imports, we have uh, a lot of uh, consumer goods, either small electronics uh, or fast moving goods in that field. So uh, what has been happening, uh, in fact, the deficit I is due to the fact that we don't have enough basic infrastructure. So crucial investments in uh, roads, transport network, energy uh, is very crucial. And that's where we see Chinese interest being complementary in the, in the region. Because a lot of the support that Africa is getting from China is towards putting up critical railway roads as well as uh, building, uh, investing in energy and telecommunications. One last point is, as we see uh, China's growth, and as we see uh, you know, the, its emergence uh, or it being a crucial player in international development, some of this development assistance is actually uh, landing in Africa, um, you know, basically uh, seconding or giving a vote of confidence to, to the potential that Africa has. Well, let, let's look at that potential that Africa has, uh, A.K. Ubiji, and you've talked about the constraints to industrialization, infrastructure, and energy. But what is it African countries are doing, though? Because now there is this opportunity, but what are they doing? Um, quite, you're quite right, uh, Moderator. The opportunities are there. Uh, there's no doubt about that. The, we have huge opportunities, especially in the non-oil sector, agri and agro allied sector, we have a lot of raw materials that could be processed into finished goods. And you can only do that when you have manufacturing outfits. That, that is very, very key. The opportunities are quite, is it only in the industrial sector? Even in the power sector, opportunities are there. We have water, we have sunlight, through which you can, even wind, you can use that to generate power to run your industries. So in the telecom sector, a lot of things have happened in the past few years. The telecom industry in Africa is really moving very strongly. So the potentials are quite huge. Right. It's just for our governments to pay serious attention, to identify those loopholes that could be covered so that industrially Africa can move forward, so that we can export. Instead of exporting commodities and raw materials, we can export finished manufactured goods. All right, uh, Professor Howen Peak, let, let's draw on some of the examples and some of the lessons that African economies can learn uh, from uh, Southeast Asian countries because Asian countries like China and Bangladesh, they did grow uh, out of the uh, manufacturing uh, situation in their countries. What exact lessons can African countries learn from China, learn from Southeast Asian countries? Uh, well, there are a lot of experience, uh, China and Malaysia and Singapore and South Korea, all those uh, Asian uh, countries uh, can be shared uh, with African countries. Uh, being the latecomer, actually there are lots of advantages uh, because you don't need to repeat uh, those mistakes has been made uh, by uh, those uh, uh, faster, uh, first rounders. For example, uh, like China, we have gone through those uh, economic development uh, with uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, less uh, protection of environment. So those uh, experience, uh, the lessons uh, could be avoided by latecomers of Africa. So I think uh, uh, maybe the most valuable experience is the industrial park and also those economic uh, and the trade zone building. Uh, because at the very beginning, like uh, in the 1980s, uh, when China also was facing uh, this shortage economy and the industrialization level is quite low. And then uh, we opened, uh, set up quite a lot of uh, uh, those special uh, economic zones and industrial park around those coastal uh, provinces uh, around the eastern coast of China. So those economic zones and industrial park, they enjoy uh, a lot of uh, preferential policies like tax uh, redemption and also uh, even tax-free. 
and then they uh, invited, attracted a lot right. of uh, foreign investors in. So through those uh, technical know-how transfer and the management uh, uh, skill transfer, and then gradually those experience can be shared and spill over to other uh, provinces in China. So this is a trickle-down uh, effect. So uh, from uh, one place to another. And another experience, I think, is the township enterprises uh, building. Because China, basically speaking, is also a rural society. A lot of uh, uh, countryside people, uh, they, if they all rush to the big city like Beijing, Shanghai, uh, that will uh, increase lots of burden uh, for the city uh, construction and also that is uh, do no good uh, for the country's uh, all, uh, general, the overall reform right. and the opening. So to yeah, establish township enterprises, that's a good way <laughs> to absorb those increasing, uh, those migrant workers and the rural uh, people transfer themselves from farmer uh, to the workers nearby. David, Africa is a late comer. I did see you agreeing with Professor Howen Ping there. Your comment? Yes, if you, you know, to the question, what is Africa doing? Um, if you look at uh, governments within Africa, have realized that much of our trade within uh, intra-African trade, that is trading amongst member states within Africa, uh, actually comprises of more value-added goods. Now, these value-added goods are the manufactured goods which provides, uh, provide quality jobs and higher income, uh, incomes than our commodity base. So what governments are now doing, uh, we are trying to harmonize uh, our trading regimes so that uh, they can be more harmony, so that our markets can be expanded. Uh, specifically, there are two initiatives right now going on. You have a tripartite initiative, which is bringing together uh, regional, regional groups uh, of the SADC, ESC, and COMESA. And then there's also a continental-wide uh, regional integration effort, or the continental free trade area. And these are all uh, aimed towards expanding the African market and making it easier for African countries to trade with each other. Because this is the trade, this kind of trade is the one that uh, creates more jobs and is the one that will bring about that industrialization. So Chinese participation and establishment of Chinese companies within Africa actually uh, um, will take advantage of that market uh, uh, in terms of uh, being able to access more commodities and provide more commodities to this market. Right. Uh, but of course, uh, many people have said uh, and economists have put it that industrialization is a must if Africa has to uh, maintain its uh, economic growth and to create jobs yeah. and so forth. Do you see, though, Africa's uh, industrialization challenges as surmountable? They are surmountable. Uh, in fact, this story of uh, uh, intra-African trade is the glimmer of hope that we have. Because given the trading frameworks that we have currently, uh, if we, you know, traditionally we've exported commodities and primary and raw products. The moment we try to value add and export to the same markets, we face tariff escalations. So uh, our products are no longer competitive uh, and, uh, you know, we end up losing the market altogether. But within Africa, we can export, uh, you know, value added products. And uh, indeed, even our, our terms of trade show it that uh, the most revenues that we get are from our value add, much as uh, commodities are still the mainstay for forex and also, also uh, export capabilities. Uh, but even, even if you talk about African multinationals, these uh, have been proven to be companies which export commodities within Africa. And we're going to leave it there for the moment this week. That's all we have time for this week. But thank you to my guests for their insights in Lagos. Eke Obeji, Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. In Beijing, Professor Ho Wen Ping, a research fellow at the Institute of West Asian and African Studies. And in Nairobi here with me, consultant economist David Owiro. Thank you all for joining in the conversation. And remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. To join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.